Good morning, everyone. Welcome to FMG. I'm Davison Lopez. I'm the Deputy Dean for International Affairs. Uh, originally, I'm a professor of political science at the School of Humanities. And uh, I'm here to let you know that we are thrilled, very excited to have this beautiful international class gathering together at UFMG. So you make up a very diverse group, around 60 students coming from 15 different countries and 22 higher education institutions. We are really, really pleased to welcome you to our campus and to share with you some uh, ideas and some preliminary lessons on Brazil. And for the two coming weeks, you are having, I'm pretty convinced, you're going to love it. You're having excellent lectures on a host of aspects regarding Brazil. So enjoy as much as you can this unique opportunity. This is my piece of advice. Uh, so uh, a few housekeeping announcements before we proceed. Uh, you know that you are being evaluated. Uh, then this assessment will be made by me, myself. I'm professor, uh, the one responsible for marking you at the end. So what we expect from you, besides your enthusiastic participation on the summer school, is sort of a board diary each and every one should compose. So for each day, you are expected to come up with a bill, with a tweet, with a short text, which should be representative of your experience, so that we can learn what you have apprehended from this course, from this experience. And there are two ways for you to, to proceed in order to, to get tracked and marked. The first option would be you to create a Twitter account, if you don't have one yet, and start following our institutional profile at UFMG SSBS 2019. UFMG SSBS, Summer School on Brazilian Studies, it's an acronym, 2019. Or the second option, you can use our hashtag, the official hashtag for UFMG Summer School on Brazilian Studies 2019. So hashtag UFMG SSBS 2019. Either way, I'll be watching you guys. I'll be watching you guys. And here, I mean, my role is more of a convener than properly of a teacher. So your instructors, you already know their names, and they are experts in a host of fields. So uh, I will be just overseeing the whole experience, both from an academic as well as a administrative uh, perspective. But so this is housekeeping announcement number one. Make sure you are either I mean, following our account or using the official hashtag. So please uh, don't forget to compose a short 140 character essay for each day of your experience, okay? And number two, uh, I have the pleasure to announce that for the second week, we are having a very special guest Ambassador Celso Amorim, I don't know if many of you are familiar with this name, but Celso Amorim, he used to be Brazil's foreign minister, also defense minister. Uh, a couple of years ago, he was dubbed the best foreign minister in the world by a very prestigious uh, American magazine, foreign policy magazine. 
So uh, he's just confirmed he will be with us, sharing with you his views on Brazil and the world today. Uh, this is for the second week. And uh, by the second week, you will be much more equipped with you know, your body of knowledge on Brazil. So we'll get a chance to raise very tough questions uh, as we are having a Q&A with Professor, uh, Professor Ambassador Celso Morin. He's also an academic. Uh, so that's it for now. Uh, I want to leave you with Professor Rafael Escopa Casa and I'm pretty sure you're having a, a wonderful lecture for the next two hours. Whatever you need, just let us know, okay? And uh, make sure you are included in the WhatsApp group. It's an important source of official information as well, okay? Enjoy and have the time of your lives. And, and don't forget it. This is all about networking, so please become friends. <laughs> Well, thank you, uh, Davison, for that introduction. Um, well, good morning, everyone. Um, first of all, I'd like to, to thank Davison and all the or other organizers for inviting me to, um, to come and talk to you about the history of Brazil. I should say straight off that I'm not exactly a, a Brazil history expert. I'm more of an ancient history person myself, more specifically Roman history. Um, but it's certainly been very exciting to, to come back to Brazilian history. Um, and I'm certainly very keen to talk a little bit about it with you guys today. Um, so in today's lecture, um, I plan on going as far as the 1980s, but no, no, no farther than that. Um, the, um, I, I thought I might leave the discussion of, of the last three, three or four decades, like current affairs, to uh, my colleagues who will be delivering the, the succeeding lectures um, on Brazilian politics, Brazilian foreign policy, uh, economy, society. Um, so that's more or less the, um, the idea. Um, and I know that in, uh, in the pro it says on the program that uh, uh, we're going to be talking about Brazilian history from the age of the European discovery, but I actually thought it would be interesting to say a little bit about the, the period before the, the arrival of the, the Europeans, or the Portuguese specifically. So, um, so let's kick off, shall we? Um, so before the arrival of the Portuguese in around fi in 1500, indigenous societies were spread across what was to become Brazil, and they'd been here for at least 12,000 years. It's consensual that the American continent was the last to be peopled by modern humans, uh, and this happened sometime between 25 and 15,000 years ago. Estimates obviously uh, vary. Genetics researchers here at UFMG have been at the forefront of studies into the peopling of the Americas, uh, and recently they published a couple of groundbreaking articles that shed some exciting new light on, on the subject. Um, the lead author of one of these articles, Tomás Pinochi from the biology department, argues that there were three or four founding lineages of Asian settlers in the Americas. And this is based on a sample of Y chromosomes uh, of present day indigenous individuals, as well as some ancient DNA ana uh, data. So Pinotti and his team have concluded that South America was occupied relatively rapidly, and of course this means 2,000 years, um, in the course of 2,000 years, most likely via the, uh, the Pacific route. Uh, so, I'm not sure I... Um, the Pacific coast. So this initial wave was then followed by several others um, after the Bering Ice Bridge that connected America and Asia disappeared around 12,000 years ago. 
the, uh, the authors also identify a strong correlation between genetic and geographical proximity among their sampled indigenous individuals. Uh, and this is interesting because it suggests that the original incomers um, quickly developed into sort of tightly knit um, place-based communities. And if, if this theory is confirmed in, in future studies, it would help to um, explain, among other things, the extraordinary linguistic diversity that is um, still found among um, the Amerindian peoples of Brazil today. What you're seeing there um, is a national park. It's called the Serra da Capivara uh, Park. It's located in the northeast of Brazil, in the state of Piauí, um, quite a long way away from here. And this area is interesting. Um, it's very important for pre-Columbian history because it has the largest and possibly the oldest concentration of archaeological sites not just in Brazil, but all of the Americas. The, the Capivara mountain range, oh, sorry, Capivara mountain range uh, was apparently densely populated in the, in the pre-Columbian era, possibly um, as early as 12,500 years ago. And uh, the amazing rock art or um, cave paintings uh, from the Serra da Capivara National Park are uh, very interesting because they depict, they depict um, a wide range of scenes which are often very difficult to interpret but, but nonetheless, and maybe for that very reason, uh, fascinating. They're very, you know, very interesting. Um, so this one, for example, um, it could possibly be uh, the depiction of a birthing scene, although we can't be entirely sure. I mean, like, like I said, the, these images can be a bit ambiguous, and also they're a bit difficult to date. I mean, they, they could potentially date um, from 12,000, 11,000, 10,000 years ago, at, uh, you know, at the earliest. This, um, this next one, for example, um, would anyone like to venture a guess as to what's being depicted here? Um, anyone? Possibly? No? Well, yeah, it, it sort of looks like a hunting scene, doesn't it? I suppose that would be the, uh, the most plausible interpretation, especially because we have here um, what, what could be um, potentially the, um, the depiction of megafauna. You're familiar with megafauna, aren't you? Like the large, very large mammals that um, um, inhabited South America uh, around the time the, uh, the, the first um, incomers from, from the north, from Asia, arrived. So this could, yeah, this could be a, a hunting scene. Um, and if it's to scale, then, you know, that, that could potentially be the depiction of megafauna, which would be consistent with um, the archaeozoological uh, evidence that we have uh, for that period, the existence of large, very large mammals, um, which were hunted to extin extinction. And there are also, like, other scenes um, which also seem to depict um, um, episodes in, in daily life or um, ritual life. Um, this one, for example, might depict, seems to depict a, a celebration, collective celebration of some sort, some kind of collective communal activity. Um, but again, it's very difficult. Um, we're, we're, we're often at a loss as to what these, um, what these scenes actually um, are supposed to, to represent. Um, this one, any, any, anyone else uh, want to venture a guess as to what's happening here, as to what's going on here? Hmm. I'll give you a hint. Um, it doesn't seem very pleasant, <laughs> uh, uh, at least not for some of the people involved. <laughs> 
Well, yeah, uh, perhaps. Um, some, some kind of, um, yeah, possibly ritual sacrifice, or does anyone else have another interpretation? A fight, yes, a fight. Something corporeal seems to be going on there, that's true. Um, this is actually, uh, the, the experts um, believe that it's, it's a kind of, um, it, it's possibly a, a punishment of some sort. It's a, um, a punishment scene, two individuals being, being punished, um, po possibly flogged, um, which, which, which would be interesting, uh, but, but then it's, it's really difficult to, to confirm um, that that's the, the correct interpretation. So yeah, this one is, uh, is known simply as the kiss. Um, and it's, um, it's quite nice. So uh, in, terms of the, um, in terms of the identity of these ancient communities, the, uh, the Tupi, uh, or I mean that is the people who spoke the, the Tupi language, one of the major um, Amerindian linguistic groups, the Tupi accounted for um, a vast portion of the pre-Columbian population of Brazil by the time the Portuguese arrived in 1500. Uh, and here you have a much, much later depiction of the Tupi by a Dutch painter called Albert Eckhout uh, from the 17th century. Well, two depictions actually. The Tupi are believed to have originated in the Amazon area, uh, this area that's uh, called Mosaic Zone on the map. So it'd be southwestern Amazonia. And they began to expand um, south and east, more or less around the time the Romans were conquering Western Europe, more or less 2,000 years ago. Uh, and they apparently occupied the entire stretch of the Atlantic coast, as you can see here, by the time the Portuguese arrived in, in 1500, by the time of the European conquest. The, the Tupi expansion, therefore, is considered one of the largest in ancient South America. The Tupi speakers spread across 4,000 kilometers from Amazonia all the way to subtropical Atlantic, the subtropical Atlantic coast in um, southeastern Brazil. So not too, not too far away from where we are here. What drove this expansion, this massive expansion, remains a debated topic in, in New World archaeology. One popular explanation for the Tupi dispersal out of Amazonia has been demographic growth stimulated by agriculture, uh, coupled with possibly a strong sense of territoriality, long-range political networks, and some scholars also speak of an expansionist military warlike ideology among the Tupi. So that would be an interesting parallel, another interesting parallel with the Romans there. Um, others, however, argue that the Tupi expansion of out of southwestern Amazonia was a response to the onset of drier climate conditions that reduced the forest around 2,000 years ago. Uh, and this would have forced the Tupi groups to migrate to these other regions. This theory has been favored uh, by some Brazilian archeologists, but overall it remains very controversial. What is relatively certain is that outside of Amazonia, Pottery that is recognizable as Tupi appears um, between three to 2,000 years uh, ago before present. In a recent assessment of, the, of this archaeological evidence, uh, Jose Iriarte, a professor of archaeology at the University of Exer, Exeter, um, and his team uh, argue that the Tupi reached the southeast of Brazil around two, two and a half thousand years ago. So sometime in the second half of the first millennium BC. And interestingly, the, the, the Tupi word for the land that they occupied was apparently Pindorama, 
And this roughly translates as the land of the palm trees, or, or more literally, there will be palm trees in, in the Tupi language. Uh, the Tupi expansion displaced previous groups who already occupied the Atlantic coast, and these are generally known as the J speakers. You can, it would be yeah, on the map. Um, their probable distribution at the time of the European arrival is, is reconstructed on this map. And um, owing to the Tupi expansion, the, the Zhe speakers were apparently driven away from the coast and towards the uplands of central Brazil. The name by which the Tupi called the, the Zhe speakers that they displaced was Tapuya. Uh, and this roughly translates as something like stranger, foreigner, enemy, or barbarian even. And here we see some of the so-called tapuyas, um, again, in a much, much later depiction from the 17th century, but by the same Dutch uh, painter, Albert Heckhout. Uh, stereotypical images of Stone Age hunter-gatherers frozen in time were once very common in, in Brazilian history textbooks. They're now giving way to much more dynamic understandings of pre-Columbian societies who practiced various types of agriculture and were obviously organized enough to be able to build monumental structures even, some of which may have functioned as um, public spaces. In the Amazon, for example, evidence of intense agriculture and dense settlement are coming to light. This exciting new information is really altering the way in which we view the, um, the history of the Amazon, which, as you may know, until very recently was seen as this pristine primordial jungle that, that had always been there, and, and now it's, it's you know, apparent that it, 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 that's not the case. Um, so aerial photography and geophysical survey have both been revealing the existence of highly complex societies with a rich and sophisticated culture, uh, which, which obviously included monumental architecture, and this, the aerial photography here gives you an idea of the kind, the kind of structures that are coming to light. Here you have some examples of what is known as the Marajó culture, and that's an archaeological culture with a very distinctive pottery style, as you can see, and it developed in northern Amazonia, more or less around the time of the European Middle Ages. When the Portuguese arrived in 1500, the indigenous population of Brazil may have been around 3.5 million, with several hundred linguistic and culture groups. Uh, a linguistic survey from a while back identified a total of 188 living indigenous languages in Brazil with 155,000 speakers in total. As for the so-called uncontacted tribes, or communities, I should say communities, in early 2007, uh, the Brazilian government agency that is responsible for the, the indigenous communities, uh, and that's FUNAI, F-U-N-A-I, reported that it had confirmed the presence of 67 different uncontacted tribes in Brazil, which is up from 40 in 2005. So this increase um, meant that Brazil had surpassed New Guinea uh, as the country that houses the largest number of so-called uncontacted peoples in the world. Um, so by the time the Portuguese arrived in Brazil in, in April 1500, Portugal had a thriving commercial empire that spanned the entire globe with outposts in Africa, India, as you can see on the map, 
in even Ming China and Japan. And here uh, you have a 16th century Japanese print uh, that shows a Portuguese vessel. In the early 16th century, the Portuguese controlled the spice trade between Europe and the East. This global empire, however, uh, would soon falter, and by the early 17th century, Portugal had already been superseded as a world power by other European nations, uh, chiefly Spain and the Netherlands, in the 17th century, that is. In the earliest days, the Portuguese weren't really sure about what they wanted to do with Brazil. Um, it wasn't until 1530 that the first efforts to occupy and settle Portuguese South America were more permanently, uh, more permanently were put in place. And this here might be the earliest Mapa Mundi uh, that shows the Brazilian landmass in the bottom left corner there. Uh, this would be it. Initially, the Portuguese believed that Brazil was an island, by the way. Um, so these initial efforts at colonization in the early 16th century involved the creation of the so-called captaincies. And these were the main colonial units, more or less equivalent to the 13 English colonies in North America, more or less, not exactly the same, but anyway, you get the idea. And it's interesting at this juncture to compare the ways in which European, uh, different European powers appropriated the new world so as to put the, um, the Portuguese approach in, in its broader context. So you'll see how, how distinctive, just how distinctive it actually is. Um, the English, for example, relied on natural landmarks, such as trees, rocks, mountains, rivers, to demarcate the, the, the lots and uh, that, that, that were assigned to, to settlers. The Spanish, on the other hand, relied on the granting not of land, but of people, of work groups. And these were basically enslaved um, native peoples who were assigned to individual Spanish colonists, the groups, groups of enslaved native individuals who were assigned to individual Spanish colonists. And these were the so-called encomiendas in Spanish. The Portuguese, however, were very different. Um, they were, as you know, um, a deeply seafaring people. They had been pioneering the um, sailing of the Atlantic since the 14th century. So in good nautical fashion, uh, they used the sextant, which is this um, instrument, this sailing instrument that you can see here in the bottom left right corner, uh, to mark off slices of territory in a more geometric fashion. And these became the, the captaincies that you can see on the map, like the main colonial units. It's also important to note that the Portuguese presence and colonization was mainly confined to the coast. The Portuguese had this habit of hugging the coastline, um, and this played an important part in how the Portuguese colonization would develop throughout the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries in Brazil. From the very beginning, the Catholic Church was closely involved in the Portuguese colonization of Brazil. And this means that from the outset, the colonial period of Brazil's history is marked by the conversion of indigenous peoples to Catholicism. From very early on, ever since the, the first arrival of the Europeans in the American continent, the Catholic Church was interested in converting the masses of indigenous peoples. And this was very much a result of changes that were happening in Europe at the time. Many of you obviously know about the Counter-Reformation. In a nutshell, this was the Catholic Church's response to the, the Catholic Church's reaction to the various, like the wave of Protestant reformations uh, that spread throughout Western Europe in the first half of the 16th century. So simply put, to compensate for the loss of supporters in Europe, the, the Catholic Church decided to invest heavily in sending out missionaries to the recently discovered 
New World. Their aim was to convert as many natives as possible into Catholicism. And Portugal was, of course, a Catholic country, uh, so it, along with Spain, cooperated with the, uh, the, Catholic, the interests of the Catholic Church, though not without some degree of tension, as we will see soon. The Catholic missionaries who came to Brazil were mostly from the newly created Company of Jesus. Um, they were known as the Jesuit priests. And they're still around today, though not so much in Brazil, and we will come back to this in a minute. Um, the painting you, you see uh, depicts the founder of the Jesuits, the, the founder of the Company of Jesus, a Spanish priest called Ignacio de Loyola. The Jesuits in Brazil set up missions all over the territory, not just in the more populated coastal areas, but also in more remote places further inland. These uh, Jesuit missions were usually set up inside or right next to existing indigenous settlements, villages. That one there is um, in the south of Brazil, the southern state of Rio Grande do Sul. It was one such Jesuit mission that generated the city of Sao Paulo, uh, for example, which many of you may have flown into on your way here. Um, to put it more accurately, though, Sao Paulo, like many other Brazilian cities, originated as a merger between the Jesuit college, um, which was founded in, in Sao Paulo in 1554, and the pre-existing indigenous villages right next to them. So that's why um, many of these earlier colonial um, Brazilian settlements were made up of indigenous groups who converted to Catholicism, to Christianity, and apparently soon ceased to identify, to self-identify as Tupi or J or any of the other linguistic, ethnic groups. The, the Jesuit priest who founded the college in Sao Paulo was José Genchieta, uh, which is why until recently he was considered the founder of Sao Paulo, although as we've just seen, that's not quite the full story. Um, he was nonetheless a, a remarkable character um, from the Canary Islands, uh, who lived in Brazil uh, for a good portion of his life in the very beginning of, of Euro uh, Portuguese colonization. He wrote several major ethnographic and linguistic treatises about the native inhabitants, which are still extremely valuable today, the treatises, I mean, um, as a source of information, for example, on the, the old the old Tupi language. Uh, however, although Portugal, as a Catholic country, was initially willing to support the interests of the church, it didn't take long for conflicting interests to emerge. The arrival and the spread of the Jesuits soon clashed with the interests of the Portuguese colonists, who would much, more, who would much rather enslave the indigenous peoples and exploit them as laborers rather than having them converted into Catholicism um, and living in Jesuit missions. And this grew into a major conflict of interest which lasted the entire colonial period uh, in Brazil. The relationship deteriorated so much that by 1750, um, the, uh, the Jesuits were expelled from the colony. They were expelled from Brazil. At any rate, it would be wrong to see the indigenous peoples as a separate passive entity that was fought over by Europeans, that is the Jesuits and, and the, the, the lay colonists. The situation on the ground was much more complicated and uh, for that reason, fascinating. In fact, uh, there are many indications that from early on, indigenous peoples either intermarried with Portuguese colonists, who were, by the way, overwhelmingly male, and we will soon get back to this point. So they either intermarried with the Portuguese or they moved um, more or less willingly 
into colonial settlements, very often the plantations, or in Portuguese, the ingenhos, uh, where sugar, tobacco, and spirits were produced for export. After only a few generations, these assimilated indigenous people no longer self-identified as indigenous, or more accurately, as Tupi, J, or any of the other uh, ethnicities. The first children of Europeans and Amerindians were at the time called mamelucos, um, a term which roughly corresponds to the Spanish word mestizo. In this 17th century painting, also by um, Eckhout, um, depicts two such individuals from the northeast of Brazil. The word mameluco probably derives from the Arabic mamluk, which means slave, um, and it was commonly used in reference to soldiers or rulers even who had slave origins, especially in Egypt. So arguably, all of this process of intermarriage and integration helped form the demographic basis of the population of colonial Brazil, though the African contribution, as we will see, um, was also key. Today, genetics research suggests that all modern Brazilians are, on average, 8% Amerindian, uh, genetically, I mean. So uh, this initial colonial encounter was actually more com was a more complicated process than it seems at first sight. We are not necessarily talking about indigenous peoples being westernized or acculturated in an absolute way. In Sao Paulo and Rio, for example, you get tribal chiefs who convert to Christianity and then go on to change their names and found some leading so-called settler aristocratic families uh, of the colonial period. The founder of the powerful Souza, or in Brazilian Portuguese, Souza uh, clan from Niteroi, which is close to Rio, uh, was a man called Araribóia. He was chief of the Temimino tribe, um, and he helped the Portuguese drive out the French from Rio in the late 16th century. And in return for his services, Araribóia was given the name Martin Afonso de Souza and a large estate. So in many significant ways, we could say that this individual Amerindian became a colonial settler and landowner. And there were probably many more like him. Though, as we will see, uh, the whole issue of land owning was complicated in colonial Brazil because technically only the king of Portugal was allowed to own land. We will get to that in a minute, get back to that in a minute. As a result of this peculiar situation, um, as late as the first half of the 19th century, the main language spoken in places like Sao Paulo was not Portuguese, but rather Nyengatu, uh, which is a Tupi word for something like general language or pidgin. Um, so this was a kind of lingua franca, which consisted of elements from several Amerindian languages, chiefly Tupi, but not exclusively, uh, and which was spoken widely, not just in Sao Paulo, but throughout Brazil, until it was outlawed, it was outlawed in the 18th century. Uh, Nyengatu eventually died out in the course of the 19th century when efforts to Europeanize Brazil uh, were very much underway, as we will see in a bit. This slide that you're seeing shows some examples of Nyengatu words, many of which are still present in modern day Brazilian Portuguese. And I wonder if uh, anyone can tell me which, which uh, of the words that are shown 
are still spoken in, in Brazilian Portuguese today. And I'm looking now, obviously, at the Brazilian uh, students in the audience. Uh, Mingao, perfect. So, so this. Uh, so, how would you translate Mingao? Uh, what would be a translation for Mingao? Anyone? It's a kind of porridge. It's a kind of porridge. I, I guess that would be the approximation, a porridge. I'm not sure what it's made of or whether it's supposed to be made of something specifically. Anyway, um, what else? What other words are, are still... Hmm? Maracujá. Oh, there we go. Yeah. So, so uh, obviously, uh, passion fruit. It's our word for passion fruit. Um, what else? Yeah, capoeira. Um, actually, this came as a bit of a surprise to me because I, I didn't realize that capoeira was an indigenous, uh, was a Nyingatu word. I, I was assuming it was of African origin, but, but anyway. Um, what else? There, there, there are a couple more. You, you might be able to catch a glimpse of these majestic creatures. Um, uh, in, in, uh, yeah, they, they, they inhabit the, uh, the lake just uh, uh, right next to the uni. Um, it's um, Lagoa da Pampulha. So if you have a chance, if you get a chance, you should, you should um, take a hike and, and, and go see the, the Lagoa da Pampulha. And you may, if you're lucky, you'll, you'll catch a, gl a glimpse of the capivara, uh, the ma majestic beasts. And, um, and they, yeah, so, so they, they're around. Um, yes? Oh, were they removed? Oh, that's a shame. That's a damn shame. Anyway, uh, sorry to hear that. Any, any other words? I think there's one more. Cu oh, no. Yeah, kuya. It's a, well, how would we translate kuya? A bowl, yeah, a gourd, gourd also. Okay, so, so um, this gives you an idea, right, of what I'm trying to get at. Um, it was not uncommon, it was not uncommon for indigenous communities to side with the Portuguese against other indigenous communities. Raids and wars were led by men called bandeirantes, or flag bearers. And these men made inroads into the unknown expanses of the hinterland, well, unknown to the Portuguese, of course, uh, in search of booty and slaves. The interesting thing is that the indigenous people often made up the cohorts of these bandeirantes, and, and they fought alongside Europeans against other Amerindian peoples. Some of the leading bandeirantes were themselves of indigenous extraction, owing to intense intermarriage between Portuguese men and indigenous women, as we've just discussed. One of these bandeirantes, one of the most famous bandeirantes, was a man called Domingos Jorge Velho. He was from Sao Paulo, uh, and he's known for having destroyed a major settlement of runaway slaves, uh, runaway African slaves, um, called a quilombo in the late 17th century. And this was the Quilombo dos Palmares, located in the modern state of Alagoas in the northeast. It's actually a very long way away from here. And it was home, the Quilombo dos Palmares was home to the famous rebel slave hero, Zumbi. We'll get back to that soon. All of this, of course, does not deny the fact that indigenous peoples were massacred and exterminated throughout the colonial period. In many ways, the interaction between Europeans and indigenous groups um, was violent and disastrous. And I certainly don't want to paint too rosy a picture of this colonial encounter. It's enough to glance at some then and now maps uh, showing the spread a number of indigenous cultures and languages to see just how negative the colonial encounter turned out to be for the native inhabitants of Brazil. Colonization often meant the loss, annihilation, 
and disappearance of rich indigenous cultures and worldviews, as well as a dramatic reduction of the indigenous population itself. Um, nevertheless, we must not lose sight of the fact that identity is a complex phenomenon. In many cases, as we saw, um, acculturation, uh, sorry, what happened was not exactly the complete acculturation of indigenous peoples, but rather a change in the way that these peoples viewed themselves and were viewed by others. Their contact with European culture and people, which was also sometimes peaceful, sometimes it wasn't peaceful, sometimes it was peaceful, um, did not always mean the complete annihilation of their culture. It's important to remember in this sense that by 1680, the enslavement of indigenous people had been officially outlawed in the colony. And by 1750, all indigenous settlements in Brazil received the status of villages, which put them on a par legally um, with uh, the Portuguese created settlements. And on that note, um, the Portuguese basically saw Brazil as a cash cow. Um, the aim was to exploit the colony as much as possible with as little effort as possible. This was a highly predatory kind of colonization that was centered primarily on exploitation by the metropole and not, for example, on settlement or the construction of a new society as was arguably the case in, uh, for example, many of the English colonies in North America. So for this reason, uh, the entire colonial period can be summarized as a series of exploitation-driven economic booms. First came the sugarcane and tobacco plantations, then the gold rush here in Minas in the 1700s, tailing off with the rubber boom in the Amazon and the coffee boom in the southeast, mainly Sao Paulo. Both of these latter two booms um, carry on into the post-independence period. There is, of course, a lot more to Brazilian history than just that, um, but it seems very important to me to note that the colonial era was, in many ways, um, a foreshadowing of the way in which Brazil, modern Brazil, would function. Um, in a way, it would be fair to say that Portuguese colonization was frequently a reaction to economic opportunities and foreign threats. And these threats were namely, they namely came from um, other European nations. And in fact, it's important to remember that the Dutch managed to occupy northeastern Brazil and its rich sugar farms, its rich sugar plantations, uh, in the mid 17th century, hence those paintings by the Dutch guy that you just saw, um, though, though they did this only temporarily. They were driven out um, by, by the 1650s, I think, the Portuguese reestablished control. Um, and the topic of economic exploitation brings us to what is perhaps the biggest and most difficult issue in Brazil's history, and I'm talking here, of course, about slavery. Throughout the colonial period, different forms of free and unfree labor coexisted in Brazil. Um, there were free peasants, for example. There were free craftspeople in the cities. And there were free merchants. However, the bulk of the workforce consisted of enslaved individuals. And the main challenge for historians who tackle this issue is to understand the nature of Brazilian slavery and how it compares with other slave-based societies, major slave-based societies in modern history. So on that note, let's start with a few comparisons. Uh, one big difference between slavery in the U.S. and in Brazil is that in the U.S., slavery was sectional. Uh, that is, there was, for example, the division between 
slave and free states. Whereas in Brazil, it was a lot more widespread. Brazil received more Africans through the Atlantic slave trade than any other nation in the world. The Portuguese imported 10 times more slaves into Brazil than the British brought to the US. Around 4 million enslaved Africans were brought to Brazil between the 16th and late 19th centuries, whereas 465,000 were taken to the English North American colonies. To put these figures in perspective, um, an estimated total of 10 to 12 million Africans were forcibly brought to the Americas between 1500 and 1880. Of these, 48% went to the Caribbean, the British colonies in the Caribbean, well, not just the British ones, of course, and 41% came to Brazil. So this gives you a general idea of just how disproportionate the number of Africans brought to Brazil is in comparison with the US, which as you can see, received only about 5% of the total. Obviously, uh, this historical process created exceptionally strong ties between Brazil and Africa, which are still very prominent today. The northeastern state of Bahia, for example, which is the state um, just north of this one, just north of Minas, um, includes the largest number, Bahia includes the largest number of African descended people outside of Africa. And the strong African cultural heritage is the hallmark of the local culture there. Most of the Africans who were brought to Brazil came from Angola and the Congo region, and both of them are located in. Um, Western, Western Africa. Um, the reasons that led the Portuguese to employ Africans as slaves in Brazil are multifaceted and complex. The economics of slavery is uh, obviously a very important issue in this regard. Slaves were, of course, regarded as an economic resource. However, uh, we won't unfortunately be able to delve into this um, rather complex issue uh, just at the moment. Instead, let's talk a little bit about the conditions aboard the slave ships, which were horrific throughout the entire colonial period of the Atlantic slave trade. The, sorry, the entire period of the Atlantic slave trade. Uh, the, uh, the crossing, the Atlantic crossing, was absolutely cruel. An estimated 15% of the people died during the journey. What you're seeing there on the screen is a British abolitionist pamphlet uh, from the late 18th century showing just how horrible the conditions aboard slave ships were. And such pamphlets, such as this one, um, arguably played a very important role in the British decision to abolish the slave trade in 1807. The enslaved Africans who survived the crossing were bought and sold as property. Actually, historians consider this a specific type of slavery called chattel slavery, um, meaning that slaves in this category are considered movable property that can be bought and sold. Whatever the case may be, whatever term we choose to, to you know, describe this, uh, we're clearly dealing with people who were systematically de dehumanized. Um, when the enslaved Africans arrived in Brazil, they were sold in markets, uh, pretty much like cattle. And after they were purchased, they would be then branded, usually on the cheek, um, also very much like cattle. Sometimes slaves were the main source of wealth in colonial Brazil uh, because, as I mentioned previously, land was usually owned by the Portuguese state alone. And we will soon, again, um, another um, indication that we will soon come back to this very important aspect of Brazilian history. Uh, enslaved people 
performed many different types of jobs, uh, many different types of work in Brazil, from housekeeping, even to, to specialized craft production. However, the vast majority of enslaved Africans were put to work as agricultural laborers in the large plantations on the coast, which mainly grew tobacco and sugar cane, as we saw earlier. And here you have a 17th century engraving of a sugar mill in, uh, or engenho in Portuguese, in, uh, in the state of Pernambuco, uh, which is also in the northeast uh, coast, on the northeast coast. You, you can just about make out the, um, the enslaved individuals performing various tasks. Slaves planted and harvested the sugar cane and processed it into sugar an extremely hard type of work that went on for 10 out of 12 months of the year from sunrise to sunset. All aspects of this work were tough, but perhaps the most extenuating bit was the harvest and processing, which had to be done in a hurry because sugarcane juice goes sour in one day, in just one day. So slaves would work 48 hours nonstop harvesting and grinding the sugar cane and boiling the juices in order to process it into sugar. Uh, the grinding of the sugar cane was often done with two or three big rollers. And this was perhaps the most dangerous bit of the job uh, because sometimes the slaves' hands would get caught in the rollers so people would often get mutilated on top of everything else. Uh, so as you can see, um, working conditions in these plantations were so harsh that by the late 18th century, uh, the average life expectancy of an enslaved male individual was only, in Brazil, was only 23 years. This compares very poorly with uh, contemporaneous figures from the British colonies in the Caribbean and North America, where living and working conditions were um, apparently a lot better. So it would seem that Portuguese-run uh, slavery was particularly brutal. This was so much the case that, by th that the slave population of, of colonial Brazil was apparently never able to grow on its own. Um, because, on average, enslaved individuals didn't live long enough to uh, have children. This, in turn, meant that enslaved individuals had to be constantly brought in from Africa, w right down to 1888, when slavery was finally abolished in Brazil. We'll get to that later. At the turn of the 18th century, gold and diamonds were discovered right here in Minas, which, as you may know, is Portuguese for mines, Minas, mines. Uh, this landlocked region had hitherto been sparsely populated because most of the action, as we saw, was happening on the coast. But the discovery of gold around 1700 and of diamonds shortly afterwards, around the 1720s, brought about an enormous influx of people into Minas. People flocked from all corners of Brazil and also from Portugal in search of gold and diamonds. The once sleepy little villages that were few and far between um, grew all of a sudden into major economic and cultural hubs. The main examples are Ouro Preto, which you will, I think, visit very shortly, and Mariana, just an hour and a half drive, um, and also, I think you'll probably also visit Mariana. But there's also Sabará, which is even closer to, to Belo Horizonte. It's um, half an hour drive, I think. And it's, it's one of the earliest, it's one of the earliest gold rush towns in, in Minas as well as Tiradentes and São João del Rey, uh, both of which are a bit further south towards São Paulo and Rio. Uh, 
The, um, the bulk of the gold that was wrested out of the Minas Mountains ended up, of course, in Portugal. Uh, and here you have some very lavish examples of 18th century Portuguese churches that display quite a lot of golden architecture, um, as well as some Portuguese gold coins, doubloons, um, such as these from that period. However, and perhaps surprisingly, some of the Minas gold actually managed to stay around in Minas, as surprising as that may seem. Um, and it can be seen in the decoration of many amazing Baroque churches and official buildings from the 1700s, uh, many of which you will see for yourselves in Ouro Preto. Although, to be fair, the lavish church of São Francisco da Penitência in Rio also had its fair share of Minas gold, as you can see. Didn't miss out on the action. As elsewhere in colonial Brazil, slaves formed the bulk of the workforce in 18th and 19th century Minas. As in the coastal plantations, working in living conditions of enslaved individuals who mined uh, gold and diamonds were brutal. This photograph of an 18th century gold mine that still stands in Ouro Preto reminds us of just how dangerous and claustrophobic gold mining can be, especially in pre-industrial contexts. While this image of an enslaved male being flogged stresses the systematic dehumanization that these individuals were subjected to. However, because of the peculiar dynamics of gold and diamond mining, the slaves who came to Minas found themselves in a rather new kind of situation, which differed from the one in the coastal plantations in some key respects. The Gold Rush Society of Minas was more dynamic. Gold and diamonds were a lot more movable, and therefore social climbers were more frequent. Slaves who worked as miners were allowed to buy their own freedom, if they were lucky enough to find enough gold to satisfy their masters and have some left over for themselves, which they could then use to purchase their own liberty. And this phenomenon, as you know, is called manumission. And it seems to have been a rather common thing in 18th and 19th century Minas Gerais. Certainly more so than in the sugarcane plantations um, on the coast. Interestingly, one thing that freed slaves often did was to purchase their own slaves. It's very difficult to determine uh, just how common this practice was, uh, but we do hear of several slaves, several former slaves, either African-born or African-descended, who once freed go on to acquire their own slaves, their own retinues, of African-born or African-descended enslaved individuals. One interesting example concerns a freed woman called Barbara Gomes de Abreu e Lima. This isn't her, by the way. This is um, an anonymous freed woman from Minas. It's not Barbara specifically, but she may well have um, looked like that. Um, she lived in Sabará, the, the city that I just mentioned in the mid-1700s, around 1740, 1750. Um, and of course, well, Sabara is, is the next town over, as I, as I mentioned. Not only did Barbara reside in prime real estate um, in Sabara, uh, a little bit of real estate facing the main church, she was also the proud owner of seven enslaved individuals, as well as gold property Oh, sorry, gold jewelry and silverware. And uh, 
I'm proud to say that a professor here at UFMG, at the History Department, a colleague of mine called Eduardo França Paiva, um, wrote a super book about Barbara. That's the one. Um, and he concluded in his book that uh, Barbara was very likely a role model for other enslaved women of the time. Whatever we make of Barbara's personal story, more than one interpretation is obviously possible, um, her case is an important reminder of just how complex um, Brazilian slavery and society actually were in the colonial era. Don't, I don't think the book has been translated into English. I, I, I think only Portuguese language copies are available, but you can find it here in the university library. I, I highly recommend it. Anyone who's interested in that part of Brazilian history should definitely have a look. Um, the topic of slave resistance and revolt has been attracting growing attention uh, among historians in Brazil as well as abroad. Runaway slaves usually gathered together in hideouts farther away from the coast. Some of these hideouts developed into settlements, which were known as quilombos. The most famous quilombo was located in Palmares, as we discussed, in what is now the state of Alagoas in the Northeast. It developed during the 17th century and had its own organization and administrative hierarchy. Their leader was a man named Zumbi, and the Palmares quilombo uh, was destroyed in 1685, uh, but it remains a strong symbol of resistance for various political movements to this day. Uh, many communities of African Brazilians nowadays claim to derive from quilombos, and there is an official status that is recognized by the Brazilian government, um, the status of quilombo remnant, which is applied to communities that claim to have originated as quilombos, and which are officially considered to qualify as such. And here you have an example of one of them. One of the most noteworthy slave revolts is, uh, in, in Brazilian history is the revolt of the Islamic slaves of Bahia, the, the so-called Malay. And these were literate Nigerians who were enslaved and taken to, to Bahia. Um, many of them brought with them their own copies of the Quran. The Malay revolt aimed at no less that the creation, than the creation of an Islamic state in northeastern Brazil in the 19th century. Apparently, they proposed to execute anyone who was either white and or non-Muslim. Around 600 conspirators began the revolt in January 1835, uh, so this was after independence, but they were denounced and the rebellion was crushed. Speaking of independence, oh yeah, and this is a 20th, 21st century um, school book cover on the Malay Revolt. A bit of reception there for you. Because of its peculiar historical background, Brazil's path to independence was somewhat different than that of the US, of course, or even uh, from that of other Latin American countries. So we've seen how throughout the colonial period, different regions of Brazil were pretty much doing their own thing. Uh, inward looking, focused on producing and exporting their own commodities, sugar in the Northeast, gold and diamonds in Minas, etc. So this means that interdependence between the various parts of colonial Brazil seems to have been generally low. In fact, this strong trend towards regionalization, regionalism, is arguably still a major characteristic of Brazilian society today. Uh, there was low economic integration and interdependence between the individual captaincies and regions. And this is something that carries into the, uh, the post-independence period when, when each region 
um, such as the Northeast and the Southeast, um, had its own links to foreign markets, but not to each other. The result of this was the development of regional economies that became not only self-sufficient, but also rivals. Now, some of this situation can be explained in terms of geography. For one thing, the absence of major navigable rivers connecting large swathes of the hinterland to the coast, uh, for example, may have played a part in the regionalization of Brazil already in the colonial period. Uh, of course, the São Francisco River, this, which is this one here, um, as you can see, is one big exception <laughs> to this pattern. And it's a reminder that, uh, a healthy reminder, that we can't always explain, explain away social and political processes uh, in, in terms of the environment. Um, but historically, though, this lack of regional interdependence may be at the root of the weak sense of national identity that arguably characterizes Brazil to this day. It certainly suited Portuguese interests to have fragmentation rather than unity in the colony. Disunited subjects are less likely to revolt en masse, as was already clear to the Romans. Um, in addition to geography and regionalism, though, another factor that arguably helped to delay the process of independence was the strong, the very, very strong grip of the Portuguese state. We noted earlier that uh, the Portuguese approach to colonization differed significantly from that of the British or the French, in that the Portuguese were much more focused on predatory economic exploitation and rather less so on the peopling uh, and settlement of the colony. Hence the fact that the overwhelming majority of Portuguese people who came to Brazil in the colonial period were men. Their goal was not to start a new life in a new land, but rather to get rich as quickly as possible and eventually return to Europe. Of course, we know that many Portuguese colonists did settle in Brazil and did set up families, often with indigenous uh, or freed Africans as spouses. But the prevailing mindset was arguably one of personal gain, quick personal gain, and not so much of building a new home or even a new nation. On balance, it's fair to say that the Portuguese crown was rather successful in achieving its exploitative goals. Portugal certainly made it very difficult for the inhabitants of the colony to think for themselves or question the Portuguese yoke. For one thing, interaction between the colony and the outside world was heavily restricted. Brazilians were only allowed to trade with Portuguese merchants and no others. Universities and colleges were not allowed in the colony, excepting, of course, the Jesuit colleges, which, as we saw, were mainly focused on converting the, the indigenous peoples into Catholicism until they were all banned in the 1750s. So, in other words, colonial Brazil never had its own Harvard College, for example. Um, neither were industries and manufactories permitted. For example, in 1785, just as the Industrial Revolution was taking off in Britain, uh, the Portuguese queen, Dona Maria, uh, issued a decree forbidding uh, the setting up of, of textile manufacturers in Brazil. So the whole system was geared towards keeping the colony as subordinate, uh, keeping the colony subordinate and isolated from the outside world. And perhaps the greatest control mechanism was in fact, was the fact that no one in Brazil was allowed to own land. All the land technically belonged to the crown. Everyone was, at best, just a tenant. And there was no such thing, really, as a true free smallholder, for example. So as you can imagine, this had profound effects on colonial society and culture. For one thing, the absence of private property 
um, arguably made it difficult for any sense of autonomy and self-determination to develop among the inhabitants of the colony, arguably, that is. Yet, even this sophisticated system of oppression was not enough to keep some colonists from wanting to take control of their own lives. Uh, these attempts, however, even though they happened, um, they were severely undermined, as we shall see. I'm speaking here of the so-called Minas Conspiracy, or in Portuguese, Inconfidencia Mineira of 1789. This was an independence movement that was influenced by the American and the French revolutions. And here you have the, uh, the rebels, the Minas rebels, um, Latin motto um, taken from a poem by Virgil, Liberty Though Tardy, one possible translation. Uh, by the way, this template that you're seeing was subsequently adopted for the Minas Gerais state flag, um, as, you'd, as you'd expect. So the main internal cause of the conspiracy was the decline of gold mining. As gold became less plentiful, the region's gold miners faced increasing difficulties uh, to meet in meeting the tax obligations to the Portuguese crown. And when the captaincy could no longer satisfy the, the crown's demand for gold, it received an additional tax of, on gold that was called the dehama. The conspirators seeking independence from Portugal, planned to rise up in rebellion on the day that the Dehama was instituted. However, uh, they lacked well-formed plans and an overall leader. Some of them were Republicans, others were monarchists. Some of them favored the abolition of slavery, others didn't. Um, they, they did put forth a few um, unifying social and economic plans, though. They, they uh, plan to promote the, the production of cotton, the exploitation of iron and saltpeter reserves, as well as the creation of a citizen's militia. Um, and the Minas conspiracy attracted a great number of military personnel, priests and intellectuals, as well as the poets Claudio Manuel da Costa and Tomás Antonio Gonzaga. These are very familiar names for people who, are from, um, uh, who, who study um, Brazilian literature. Among the best known participants in the Minas conspiracy it was a man called Joaquim da Silva Xavier, commonly known as Chiradentes, um, tooth remover. He was arguably the conspiracy's most fervent supporter, but uh, nevertheless, the whole inconfidencia, the whole conspiracy was very much confined to Minas. Curiously, the people who led the revolt apparently didn't make much of an effort to draw in like-minded people from other regions of Brazil, which is in stark contrast to what we see in the American Revolution of 1776, for example. In other words, uh, the Inconfidencia movement had no national scope. It had no true national scope, uh, which is possibly why the Portuguese state was able to crush it with relative ease. The ringleaders were arrested and convicted as traitors. Um, and Chiradentes, shown here in the center of this painting, Chiradentes uh, was given the full treatment reserved for high treason, which involved quartering. Today, he's celebrated as a local Minas hero, as you'd expect, um, and also as a national Brazilian figurehead. Actual political independence from Portugal, however, was not very long in coming. The lead up to the independence uh, was directly connected with political changes that were happening in Europe, namely the rise of Napoleonic France. Uh, what happened was basically Napoleon's invasion of Portugal in 1807 um, prompted the Portuguese royal family to relocate or flee, depending on your point of view, um, to, to Brazil in 1808. And apparently moving to Brazil had been a fallback option 
entertained by the Portuguese court ever since the 17th century. So apparently there is some background to this decision. Anyway, the Portuguese court was um, es escorted from Lisbon all the way to Rio um, by the British Navy. And once they arrived, the Portuguese king, John VI, shown here in this um, engraving, rather comically, um, um, the, the Portuguese king, John VI, set up court in Rio. And Rio had been the colonial capital of Brazil since 1763. And this was a key moment when deeper changes began to take place and which would irrevocably alter the centuries of Portuguese domination. First, Brazil was upgraded from the status of colony to that of kingdom with, with the creation of uh, the United Kingdom of Brazil, Portugal, and the Algarve. That, that was its official name. And this happened in 1808. In that same year, 1808, um, Brazilian ports for the very first time were opened to traders other than the Portuguese themselves. And of course the British were the first to take advantage of this, uh, these new trading opportunities with Brazil. And Britain very quickly became Brazil's main trading partner throughout the 19th century. And uh, Britain held this position unchallenged until the early 20th century when uh, the US took over. These um, changes, all these changes, set about a chain reaction of events, which ultimately can be seen to lead to the Declaration of Independence in, uh, fr from Portugal in 1822. So a little bit of background to that. After Napoleon's defeat, uh, King John VI decided to move back to Lisbon, after all, but he left his son Pedro, or Peter, um, in Rio, in charge of Brazil, so to speak. But Peter eventually sided with uh, some pro-independence groups and unexpected things began to happen. Um, Peter is credited with uh, the so-called Ipiranga shout. Um, it's, it's supposed to have been this dramatic moment when um, Peter shouted independence or death on September 7th. 1822, which is uh, considered the, the official date of, of Brazil's independence. And uh, the, the scene is depicted rather, perhaps rather idealistically um, in this late 19th century painting. There was some degree of fighting between 1822 and 1823, though apparently not on the same scale as the American Revolutionary War, for example. At any rate, shortly after Brazil's independence was acknowledged by the leading powers of the time, chiefly the UK, uh, the regime adopted by the recently emancipated nation was that of a constitutional monarchy, as is showcased um, in the design of the first Brazilian flag as you can see. The Constitution was drafted and approved in 1824 with the consent of Peter, who was now Peter I of Brazil. Um, and this, by the way, was the first of seven constitutions. Brazil has had no less than seven different constitutions throughout its history as an independent nation. Um, after the 1824 one, Others followed in 1891, 1934, 1937, 1946, 1967, and finally 1988, which is the one that's currently in place. We don't know for how long. Uh, one, of the most, one of the most remarkable things about the 1824 Constitution was its relative inclusiveness. Relative, I stress the word relative, inclusiveness. Um, any free or freed person born, in Brazil, born on Brazilian soil was allowed to own, uh, sorry, was allowed to um, receive citizenship, was entitled to citizenship. Um, regardless of race, 
which is something that contrasts with uh, the race-based exclusion in the US in the 19th century. On the other hand, the 1824 Constitution excluded slaves and indigenous groups. Slaves were denied citizenship because they were regarded as, quote, excluded from society, end of quote, um, while indigenous peoples were excluded because they were, quote, uncivilized. Miscegenation was, um, at this point, adopted as a key strategy for creating a national identity. This is the moment when the idea of the mixture of the three races comes about in the history of Brazilian social thought. And this has been a powerful, a very powerful image in the political and social history of the country. It has been presented in various different guises, most notably by the 20th century Brazilian sociologist called Darcy Ribeiro, that's him. Um, at its core uh, is the idea that the Brazilian people are a combination of three different, shall we say, races uh, in more or less equal parts, um, Europeans, Africans, and Amerindians. As we've seen in our discussion of the colonial period, there is arguably some historical basis for this view, um, and lately, genetics have added to our knowledge of Brazilian historical demographics, as we mentioned. But, however, um, it's also true that the idea of the three race mixture has been used to suit various political agendas. And we must surely be very careful, um, very critical of how the admixture or miscegenation idea is employed both in academia and in society at large. In the context of early independent Brazil, however, the idea of the three race mixture seems to have been tied to efforts to construct a new national identity. José Bonifácio, the man who drafted um, the, the 1824 constitution, called it the one body of a nation. It was also a strategy of land reform since indigenous peoples were officially excluded from citizenship, their lands officially became terra nullius and were therefore reverted to the state. The, um, the 1824 constitution was also exclusionary from a socioeconomic point of view. Only the wealthy were allowed to hold public office, including obviously Congress. So this was very much an oligarchic system of government. Power lay firmly in the hands of the landed gentry, which now filled the ranks of the newly created Brazilian aristocracy. Indeed, this oligarchic aspect of Brazilian government remained the norm well into the 20th century, and some would argue to this day. It's worth pointing out that Brazil was only two, uh, finally, it's worth pointing out that Brazil was only two uh, one, sorry, one of two Latin American nations that adopted the monarchy uh, as its political regime after independence, the other country being Mexico. All other nations became republics. The Brazilian monarchy, or empire, as it was called officially, uh, was longer lived than Mexico's. It lasted until 1889. And the reason for the choice of a monarchical government is one of those difficult questions about Brazilian history. We don't have time to go into this issue in detail uh, here, but the fact that the Portuguese court was based in Brazil for over 10 years, uh, between 1808 and 1821, may have played no small part in this. In terms of uh, social and political developments, the 19th century in Brazil is marked by two major processes. One is the transition from slavery to free labor, which to a great extent correlates with the arrival of European immigrants, especially from 1880 onwards. And on the political level, we have the constitutional monarchy that lasts for about 60 years, as I just mentioned, and uh, finally gives way to a Republican government by the turn of the century. And here you have a photo of Peter II, um, 
son of Peter I, who took over as emperor of Brazil in the 1840s and was a, a very long-reigned monarch. Brazil's transition from a slave-based society to one of free labor was a slow and gradual one, perhaps slower than in other places. We don't know for sure that even after, no, sorry, we know for sure that even after the British government abolished the slave trade in 1807, African slaves kept on being shipped to Brazil in defiance, in open defiance, well, not so open, <laughs> in defiance of British policy. Uh, this was definitely still going on by 1850. By that point, however, the arrival of European immigrants was beginning to gain momentum, and this trend is closely tied to the demise of slavery. Free European immigrants gradually replaced slaves, both in the countryside as well as in the towns. This was not always a seamless process. Some of the immigrants from Europe who went to work in the coffee plantations, which was Brazil's uh, latest commodity boom in the 19th century. Um, some of these immigrants found themselves living and working in conditions that were not too dissimilar from that, from those of, of the former slaves. And here you have a photo um, documenting that enslaved individuals were still present, were still active in coffee plantations in Sao Paulo as late as 1882. It took some adjusting and protesting for the free European workers to be treated as such. At any rate, their arrival in increasingly massive numbers towards the end of the 19th century will have helped to move things along. Between 1884 and 1959, a total of over four million people from Europe and the Near East emigrated to Brazil. Most of these hailed from Portugal, Spain, Italy, and Germany, as well as from Lebanon and Syria, which was then part of the, the Ottoman Empire. The Japanese began arriving in 1908. The bulk of these immigrants settled in the south and southeast of Brazil. Italians concentrated in Sao Paulo. Uh, to this day, the city of Sao Paulo holds the largest number of Italian descendants than any other place outside Italy. Huge numbers of Germans and Italians also made their new homes in the southern states of Rio Grande do Sul, Santa Catarina, and Paraná. Those are the three uh, southernmost states of Brazil, uh, neighboring Argentina. Uh, there, these immigrants, these German and Italian immigrants, formed close-knit communities that made a point of retaining their own native dialects of German and Italian, such as Hunrukish uh, and certain types of Venetian. In fact, most of the Italians who emigrated to Brazil hailed from the northern regions of Veneto and Lombardy, which interestingly contrasts with uh, the trend in the US, where most of the Italian immigrants were southerners from Sicily and Naples. Uh, at any rate, European immigration was to a significant extent sponsored by the Brazilian government. And the reasons included the desire to westernize the country or Europeanize the country, a trend that's also very much visible in other Latin American countries in this period, most notably Argentina. It's also in the second half of the 19th century that the modernization of Brazil can be seen to begin. Some major watersheds in this regard include the construction of the first railway lines, which you can see on the map. By the way, once again, we see here how each individual region um, 
was very much turned towards um, channeling its own commodities from the hinterland out to the coast uh, without any significant links among the different regions themselves. So this is one of the many hangovers from the colonial period. In the southeast, these railroads played a key role in the burgeoning coffee economy of Sao Paulo. The coffee, grown in farms in the hinterland, was transported to the coast, uh, down to the harbor city of Santos, where it was shipped to Europe and North America. It was coffee that financed the astonishing urban growth and development of the city of Sao Paulo, which, has until, which had until then been um, a sleepy little village, as you can see in this photo, which was taken just before Sao Paulo began its transformation. It's unrecognizable. As you may know, uh, Sao Paulo is the main economic and financial hub of Latin America and one of the biggest cities in the world. Much of this wealth and prosperity can be traced back to the coffee trade, which boomed in the second half of the 19th century. Sao Paulo landowners became known as the coffee barons. These men soon invested their wealth in um, luxurious mansions in the capital city, some of which are still standing. And the wealth accumulated uh, as a result of coffee exports financed the first major boost towards industrialization in the early 20th century, which naturally focused around Sao Paulo. The abolitionist movement in Brazil developed in tandem with growing European immigration and the coffee boom in Sao Paulo. Brazil was one of the last countries in the Americas to abolish slavery, and this happened in 1888, as we mentioned, as I mentioned. The effects of the abolition, however, were not entirely positive for the former slaves. As we've just seen, the Brazilian government by that point was strongly committed to supporting European and Near Eastern immigration. And this commitment continued into the 20th century. The official aim seems to have been to replace the former slaves with European free workers. This, of course, meant, that, um, meant the marginalization of the former slaves who were basically left to their own devices um, and they were clearly not the priority of the state. There doesn't seem to have been much concern with how to integrate the freed slaves socially, politically, and economically. And this is arguably at the root of much of the social inequality that characterizes Brazil to this day. Uh, the descendants of enslaved people are still socially disadvantaged, facing poverty, insecurity, and marginalization. One year after the abolishment of slavery, the Brazilian monarchy was overthrown in, in a coup led by a group of army generals in 1889. Emperor Peter II um, and his family were ex exiled and moved to Paris. A Republican government was installed and not surprisingly, uh, it was dominated and practically monopolized by the uh, coffee elites of Sao Paulo who, to some extent, to be fair, shared their political power and influence with, a signif uh, with uh, the neighboring landed gentry of Minas, um, a significant portion of which was also involved in um, the coffee trade. So this system became known as the First Republic of Brazil, and uh, it lasted uh, the, the first three decades of the 20th century and it remained very much oligarchical throughout. Its eventual demise in 1930 came with another military coup, which installed Brazil's first populist government, led by a man called Getulio Vargas. That's him. Uh, you'll notice that many avenues, many thoroughfares in Brazilian cities are named after him. There's one here in, in Belo Horizonte, but curiously enough, there is no Getulio Vargas Avenue in Sao Paulo. Uh, 
Um, I think it's the only Brazilian city that doesn't have a street named after Getúlio Vargas, I think. Um, so that's uh, interesting. So Getúlio Vargas, um, his government brought about some major social overhauls, many of which responded to popular demands that had accumulated during the First Republic. And these overhauls included a new constitution in 1934, and perhaps most importantly, the development of workers' rights and the creation of the minimum wage. Understandably, all of these measures earned him the epithet father of the poor. Oh, however, he um, tightened his grip on power in 1937 under the pretense that the country was being threatened by a Jewish communist, a Jewish communist conspiracy, which only Vargas, with his iron fist, could put down and keep at bay. This was the so-called Cohen plan, which turned out to be a total hoax. Allegedly, uh, in the name of national security, Vargas immediately shut down Congress and set up an authoritarian regime, arguing that liberal democracy had, quote, lost its practical value. Political parties were banished, individual liberties were suspended. This regime is known as the New State, or Estado Novo in Portuguese, and it managed to last until 1946, so from 1937 to 1946. This was arguably uh, Brazil's most brutal military dictatorship, perhaps even more so than the, the more recent one, which we will mention in a bit. Um, it was under the New State regime that Brazil entered World War II, in, if I'm not mistaken, 1942, although I could be mistaken. Um, although the Vargas regime had close ties with Nazi Germany, also because of certain ideological affinities between the two, um, Brazil nonetheless entered the war on the side of the Allies. And this may have largely been owing to US support uh, for the construction of a nuclear power plant in Rio. Um, in 1946, a new constitution was passed, which marked the end of the Vargas dictatorship. The 1950s began with the political demise of Vargas, who committed suicide in 1934, sorry, 1954, and the beginning uh, of a new era of economic modernization. This was very much the war cry of President Juscelino Kubitschek who was elected in 1955, and that's, that's him over there. Um, huge incentives were given to the automobile industry and to the construction of roads throughout Brazil, which incidentally led to the decommissioning of um, most of the railway lines, among other things. Kubitschek also supervised the construction of the new capital, the new federal capital, Brasilia, uh, which was inaugurated in 1960. Until then, of course, the, the capital of Brazil uh, was Rio, had been Rio. Internationally, the 1950s and early 60s are characterized by Brazil's growing proximity to the US, which was also the context uh, of the next major political event that shook the country in 1964. Um, this was yet another military coup that uh, dissolved, I think it's the third one so far, isn't it? Um, that dissolved um, the democratic regime and established a, a yet another military dictatorship which lasted until 1985, so fairly recently. This was a complex development that was determined by both internal and external factors. The military coup of 1964 was arguably the outcome of um, internal social tensions between different groups um, in Brazilian society and politics. In 1961, a, a man named João Goulart came to power. Um, he took over from the from Kubitschek's successor, who resigned in his first year in office. Goulart was seen as a communist revolutionary, 
by the Brazilian middle and upper classes of the time. Um, he intended to promote things like agrarian reforms, for example, which was regarded as highly revolutionary. Uh, and this was uh, arguably the main factor behind the military coup that ousted him in, in March 1964. There was some degree of support from the US who viewed the military as a kind of, emerge, the Brazilian military, as a kind of fallback emergency break um, on growing left-wing tendencies in Brazilian politics. We need to remember that this was the Cold War. Um, Brazil's most recent military dictatorship, the one we're discussing, was marked by contrasts. It was marked by episodes of um, economic growth, prosperity, optimism, but also by protests and violence. The protests against the military regime sometimes took the very violent form of guerrilla warfare. The Araguaia guerrilla. Araguaia is a river in, in the north of the country, uh, in, in the Amazonian region. So the Araguaia guerrilla, for example, was a communist-inspired movement uh, that was led by middle-class university students from Sao Paulo. Their aim was to bring about a kind of grassroots peasant revolution um, from the deep hinterland of Brazil. The, the movement failed and the guerrilla was crushed by the Brazilian military in the early 1970s. The redemocratization of Brazil began in 1984 when a series of mass protests throughout the country demanded the return of direct presidential elections. Since, the Bra since then, uh, Brazil has had more or less balanced periods of left and right wing governments. Although some progress has been made, there are still very serious challenges that the country needs to overcome. Deep social inequality and authoritarian tendencies, as we have seen today um, in this very brief overview, are recurring themes in Brazil's past. But so are rich cultural diversity and resilience. I can only hope that, um, by way of conclusion, I can only hope that this very brief introduction to uh, Brazilian history will further stimulate your interest in, in Brazil's history, uh, as well as Brazilian society and culture. And on that note, thank you all very much for your attention. Now, I, I understand that there is going to be a break, um, and then we can come back for questions. Is that the, uh, is that the plan? Okay. Sure, yeah. Of course, yeah, the, these things happen, yeah. Yeah, fine by me. Yeah, sure. Great, great idea. So, uh, so yes, uh, fire away. Okay. Well, there's one over here. Uh, I'm not sure if it goes all the way, though. No. Thank you so much for the whole presentation. Learned so much, I'm still digesting. Um, 
But I was, I was really, oh, uh, my name is Lesejo. I'm from South Africa, uh, UCT, um, University of Cape Town. And um, I was quite interested to know, so you said um, um, during kind of the colonial times, land was owned by the, 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 the royal family, the king um, at the time. So when they were kind of, um, you know, the first constitution, um, how was that dealt with? You know, land, like who got to own land? Right. You know, and how was, yeah. Right. That's, that's a very good question. Thank you for the question. Um, well, basically the, the issue is that theoretically all the land belonged to the crown. Of course, there were people who, who uh, were in charge of, of certain, certain allotments, like some, some larger, some smaller, but there were people who, who were um, in practice landowners. Uh, but legally, they were not the actual owners. The owner was always the, the king, or well, it was always the Portuguese crown. So, um, so what happens basically is that when, once you get to the independence bit, um, the people who already occupied the land or who, 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 who uh, had possession of the land kept on having it. Um, uh, so, so, so that's, I mean, in a nutshell, that's, that's more or less what, what happens. Um, in the colonial period, no one was, was a true, was the true owner. The only owner was, was, the, was the crown. Um, and once the crown is out of the picture, then those who already had possession of the land uh, become, the, become the actual owners. But, but that's, so basically, um, I think it's important to stress that in the colonial period, there is already, in a sense, um, um, the concentration of land in the hands of, of, of a select group, group of people, like the, the, the colonial elite. The thing is that the, even this elite technically doesn't own the land. It, it just, you know, it just the, the king leases the land to these people or, or grants it to these people, but he can, he can always take it back uh, whenever he wants to. That's, that's, you know, theoretically, that's what can happen in the colonial context. So. I'm not sure if I answered your question. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Analia. I'm from Argentina, University of Buenos Aires. And I was wondering about once the Portuguese uh, crown um, exposed the Catholic Church because of the Jesuitas. Mm. Did they support another religion, or they did, or did they only keep thinking about the slavery, and that was their really interested in the colonies? So, so um, just to see if I understand, uh, mm -hmm. you're asking if the expulsion of the Jesuits um, yes. meant that the Portuguese crown decided to support. Different, a different religion. That's yes. Well, um, well, that's that's also a very good question. Thank you. Um, not to my knowledge, no. I think that the the, the aim was to um, diminish the influence of the Catholic Church over the colony as as, as much as possible. So, so the aim was was more to um, you know to try and get rid of the, the Catholic Church's presence and influence. Um, uh, so, so that the state would have more of a more of a direct control over, you know, uh, uh, over the colony as a whole. So, so it wasn't a matter of supporting one religion versus another. It was more of uh, an attempt to try and create um, a non-religious administration. In other words, a kind of colonial administration that was devoid of um, any significant kind of religious influence or um, religious interests. Um, I think that was more or less the, the gist of the thing. Uh, when you look at um, the, the Marquis of Pombal, he was this um, Portuguese aristocrat who, who was, he was personally responsible for banishing the Jesuits in the 1750s. And this was a man who was very much committed to creating a lay, a lay state. Um, um, so it's, it's actually a bigger, a bigger kind of process when you think about it, because it's not just Portugal. I think something similar happens in the Spanish colonies, if I'm not mistaken. 
um, ar around the same time. So it's a moment when the Catholic Church is losing, losing power and losing uh, prominence in, um, in politics, um, and also, also in the colonial, um, con colonial setting. So, so yeah, but, but that, was a, that was a good question, thank you. Um, hi everyone, my name is Anda. I am from Cape Town as well, UCT. Um, you spoke about the guerrilla warfare period um, in which students that were middle class played a role in the protests. So I wanted to find out what role did women specifically play during that era in order to ensure that some form of liberation takes place? So I want you to zone in on the role of women during the liberation struggle. So, sorry, the role of who? I did it. Of women in particular. Oh, oh I see, I see, right. Uh, well, thank you for your question. Um, yes, actually, that, that's, that's a, a rather, rather interesting point, isn't it? Because if we go back to that, um, that picture I showed you, um, I mean, this one, and also this one, uh, we, we tend to see mostly men, don't we? I mean, and that's, that, that really is striking, and I, it, it, it hadn't occurred to me the first time around, um, but you're absolutely right, that there, there doesn't seem to be much of a, um, a feminine presence um, in, in these, well, not, not in these uh, photographs, at least. Um, but but I, I do know that there were women um, who participated in these, um, these guerrillas, and including the, the, the Araguaya guerrilla of um, 1967 to 1971. I think that's the, the chronological range. Um, in terms of the roles that they played and whether their participation in any way differed significantly from that of the male counterparts is something that I would have to look into. I'm not entirely sure. Um, I would say offhand that there doesn't seem to have been much differentiation in terms of what these people were doing, what they were going about, who they were talking to, how they were engaging with local communities, because one of the things they tried to do was to engage as much as possible with the local peasant communities and get them to support the cause. Again, like I said previously, this was a very much, um, as I understand it, it was very much a, a, a kind of grassroots attempt to, to, to create a, a grassroots um, peasant revolution from the, you know, from the, um, the backwater, as it were, you know, not, not that, but, you know, um, more remote rural areas. Um, so, so, yes, I mean, I, I, would, I would venture a guess, and this, this at best would be an educated guess. I mean, I, 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 could, I could recommend some bibliography if you're interested into looking, in looking into this further, but, but I would guess that um, even though there may have been fewer women um, overall, numerically speaking, I would guess that their role um, in terms of the nitty-gritty uh, daily life of, of um, guerrilla, um, um, the guerrilla movement, uh, wasn't maybe too different for, from, from that of the male counterparts. I mean, these women were also, they were also um, tortured and killed. They, I think they, they were also bearing arms, so, so I think uh, there, there, there seems to have been quite a lot of um, convergence um, uh, regarding the, the roles that were played by men and, and women. Although you're absolutely right uh, in that um, numerically, like overall, the, the, the women don't seem to be very well represented. That's, that's absolutely true, yes. Thank you. I'm not sure if I answered your question, but thanks. Does someone else have questions? Um, I was wondering, because like you mentioned, former like the the free free women and some free men as well, I guess. And you mentioned Barbara, and you said that some some slaves they were having those as role models. But is there any way to know if they had better living conditions, living with former slaves than with tr more traditional slave owners? Um. That's, that's an excellent question. Um, I, would, I would have to look at, uh, have a look at 
Eduardo Paiva's book because he definitely talks a lot about that. Um, I mean, in a way, that was how society at the time sort of operated in a general sense. People, people would have their own enslaved workers because that was, um, it was socially acceptable and it was, it was also, uh, like, like we mentioned, like I mentioned previously, um, enslaved individuals were a, 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 a chief economic resource in that society. So, so in a way it makes sense for somebody who is a freed slave to go in and want to have their own uh, slaves as soon as they become freed, uh, because that was how people, in a way that, I think Eduardo Paiva's uh, thesis is that there were these economic structures and the economic structures um, sort of um, uh, led people to behave in certain ways. So that was, you know, um, that, that was what happened in daily life and uh, so, so people, people relied on that kind of, uh, of labor. People just relied on that kind of labor. Is the well, theory of necessary evil, right? Well, yes, yes. I, I mean, uh, uh, I, I, it's not, not so much in the sense of moral judgment, but, but more, more as, as a reality of the time. So, so it, was, it, was, it was an institution. It was, slavery was an institution. Um, and, and even those people who had been at the receiving end of, of, the, of the institutions more, less, well, the, the, the uglier side of slavery, like the, pe the, the people who had been slaves themselves. What's, what, what Eduardo Paiva fi finds interesting is that even these individuals who, who, who experienced the life of a slave, once they become free, they go and get their own slaves in, in, in turn. Um, so, so it's actually a very complicated phenomenon and obviously it has all sorts of interesting cultural ramifications as well. But as to, as to your question about living standards, so you were asking whether, whether someone, a freed, a freed slave who, who owned, owned, owned their, their own slaves, slaves yeah. would have had a better lifestyle. Mm. Is that, well, yes, yes, I would say, that, well, the short answer would be yes, because, because, um, because all the hard work was done by slaves. So it was a way of, it was a way of not having to do the, the hard work, like, you know, uh, passing it on to somebody else. No, I mean, like, if these slaves that were owned by former slaves, mm -hmm. if they, they had... Oh, if they were treated differently. Yeah. That, oh, yes. Um, okay, now I get it. Um, yes, it's... Um, I think it's pretty much um, an unresolved issue in, in the historical... Um, in historical circles, there, there is a debate. What I can tell you is that there's a debate going on about that specific and very important question. Were these um, freed slaves, did, did the freed slaves treat their own slaves better or, or more generously or less, less harshly? That's, that's a brilliant point, but, but I'm afraid we just don't really know. I mean, I think um, in the case of Barbara, there is, um, there is an indication that she, well, she had seven, I think, seven slaves overall, and some of them were related. And there, is indica there, there are sources that indicate, and I, I'm a bit um, shaky on my knowledge of Barbara here, but, but there are sources that apparently indicate that at one point, Barbara decides to sell some of these related slaves, slaves who were related to each other, and she sells them to different people. Right, so I mean, you can look at you can look at that in, in different ways. Um, we don't quite know why she did that. Why she decided to sell? I think it was a mother and a daughter, or a brother and sister. I'm not exactly sure what the um, the kinship um, connection was there. But but the fact is that she had these um, slaves who were related to each other, and at one point she decides to sell them to separate people. So that can be seen as ruthless in a way. Uh, de it all depends on the context and the thing is I, I, I for one have very little contextual data at the moment uh, with which to, to, you know, to better analyze this information but, but the fact, I mean selling, selling related individuals to different owners may not necessarily be the kindest thing that you can do. I mean depending on who these people are, you know. Um, it's um, um, so, so that's, so, so there's that uh, about Barbara. Um, 
your, your question uh, reminded me of that. I should, have, I should have pointed that out during the lecture. Um, so we don't know if, if Barbara was behaving callously or whether she had a good reason to sell these people to different owners. Um, maybe they, they couldn't be together. Maybe, maybe they, they, you know, you, you, you can interpret the data in, in different ways, and that's what's fascinating about, about history, I think. And it's just you can look at the information in different ways. Um, but it's a very good question, and I would say that overall, there is an ongoing debate as, as to that, as to whether former slaves were more generous to their own slaves. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, um, so you mentioned about Darcy Ribeiro and yeah. his influence about the three different in influences in Brazil and how it's been misused in politics and in academia. Yeah. And I was just wondering whether you could elaborate on that and maybe give a few examples of how that's been misused. Thank right. you. Right, thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, wow, yes. Um, there are all sorts of issues. Um, it's a very delicate and, and, and complicated discussion. Um, to give you an example, one criticism that is often leveled against the theory of the mixture of the three races, the, the theory that the Brazilian people are uh, a mixture of Europeans, Amerindians, and Africans in more or less equal parts. Um, one argument that is to, again, bear in mind that this is not my, my area of expertise, but um, you know, m m some of my colleagues, for example, are very wary of um, referring to miscegenation or using miscegenation as a concept, for, as a lens, as a conceptual lens for understanding Brazilian history. And that's because they seem to think that it clouds the issue of social inequality. It, it diverts attention away from um, what they consider to be um, structural social inequality and towards um, um, uh, in the name of, of, um, of this idea of a national, of, of a unified national identity. So, so it would be like um, saying that uh, Brazil, if you say that Brazil is a homogene, homogenous uh, mixture of three different races, that in itself is politically perverse because it, draw, it, it draws attention away from the, um, from the systemic inequalities which um, um, affect the descendants, mostly the, the, the descendants of the, of, the, of the former enslaved individuals, the formerly enslaved individuals. Um, so so there's, that's one example. Of, of why the idea of miscegenation is considered politically, um, um, politically not very helpful because it would, it would yeah, like I said, it would, it would draw attention away from um, the fact that even though you may have a specific individual who is um, whose ancestors include Africans, Europeans, and Amerindians. Um, the most important point, um, according to the people who disagree with the miscegenation concept, is that this in is whether this individual is um, marginalized or not. And, and what, what happens in Brazilian society is that marginalized individuals normally descend from, from the, the formerly, from the enslaved Africans who were brought over forcibly. Um, so, so it's, I mean, I, I, I think it's a very complicated topic, and I'm not sure if this um, clarifies the issue in any way, but, but it's, um, in a nutshell, uh, the, the, the idea of miscegenation is considered uh, politically unhelpful. It, 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 it's, it, one, one of the arguments against it is that it, it clouds um, um, the issue of, of social inequality, it diverts attention away from social inequality and onto racial categories. Um, that, that, don't, that potentially don't really matter when it comes to talking about um, marginalization and, and, um, and inequality.
sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I was checking our lunch, so I have a good excuse for being on the phone and not paying attention. So first of all, thank you for your lecture. Uh, I'm Belen from Ecuador. So I would like to hear a bit more about your assessment of the Estado Novo period of the new state or second republic, because you mentioned that you considered it to be a more broad, brutal dictatorship than the last one, than mm. the d dictatorship that started in 1964. So mm. I would like to hear more about the key elements for you to make this statement. Mm -hmm. And also maybe, um, I know that's a very broad topic that is being discussed, but uh, I, I would like to hear more about the differentiation between the first period of the government of Getulio Vargas mm -hmm. uh, and the breaking point for the starting of the Estado Novo in 1937. Thank okay. you. Okay, okay, thanks for your question. Um, well, um, I'll take the first question first. Uh, the, um, the assessment that I referred to um, uh, about the, the Estado Novo being a, a, a more brutal dictatorship than the, than the more recent one, that's actually, I took that from, um, from an author called Eduardo Bueno. So you may want to look him up. Um, Eduardo Bueno, that's B-U-E-N-O. Um, and, uh, and there you'll, you'll find all, all, um, various arguments um, that lead him to, um, to make that statement. It's, um, <clears throat> as I understand it, he's talking mainly about the way that Vargas absolutely shut down Congress and didn't, you know, uh, and kept it um, closed, dissolved until 1946, civil liberties being, um, being abolished, um, persecution of political opposition, the, 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 um, the, um, the banishment of political parties, the elimination of political parties, so there were no more political parties at all, um, and, uh, and just generally, I think the, the whole authoritarian or even totalitarian apparatus that Vargas set up during his, his, um, his time as head of state. All of that, I think, feeds into Eduardo Bueno's assessment, which, which again, may not be the, uh, the last, the final word on the matter. I think it's, it's, it's more of a historian's perspective than, than anything else. I mean, I, I'm sure that there are other specialists who work on, on these more, the more recent periods of Brazilian history who might even disagree with, with Eduardo Bueno and, and actually argue that you know, the, the latest dictatorship was in fact more, more oppressive and more brutal than, than the um, Estado Novo. Um, so, so I would, yeah, I would stress that you know, it's, it's also a I think there's also a debate about that. So we don't, we don't know for sure that you know, which, which one was more brutal, possibly Vargas, according to Eduardo Bueno in view of things like the shutting down of Congress, uh, the elimination of political parties, um, the elimination of civil liberties, um, and, and all sorts of other uh, control mechanisms, op oppressive control mechanisms. But, um, but yes, I, I would suggest um, um, for you to have a look at Eduardo Bueno's uh, book on the Estado Novo. Um, your second question was to do with the, the establishment of, of the uh, the new state in 1937 and oh, okay. oh yes ah well um, um, I think again referring back to Eduardo Bueno um, I think his idea is that um, Vargas planned it all along and was just waiting for the right moment to strike, and, and that, that, um, that theory seems especially plausible when you consider uh, the whole sorry uh, uh, story about the Cohen plan, which is a com was a complete fabrication, it was a complete hoax. 
You know, this, this idea that um, Brazil was being threatened by a communist Jewish conspiracy, it, it obviously was meant to play on people's anti-Semitism uh, and also uh, anti-communism. So it was, it was well calculated. That's what comes across. You know, it was a well calculated kind of um, attempt um, that, was, um, uh, that was set about uh, in 1937. So, so I think there is some cause to conclude. There, is some, some, there, there are grounds for concluding that it was, um, it was possibly uh, Vargas's intention, maybe not from 1930, from as early as 1930, but, but perhaps by 1934, he may have uh, planned to, to uh, tighten his grip on power at some point, and then 19, uh, the, the occasion uh, presented itself in, in 1937. His initial, um, um, his first few years as head of state, as I said, were marked by some very popular, the passing of some very popular measures. And again, um, you know, these, these populist um, upheavals, not upheavals, but overhauls, um, which he instituted in the first few years of his government, um, were to a great extent um, a response to popular demands that had been accumulating, that, that had been, um, you know, going unheard during the, uh, the first republic, the, the first three decades of the, of the 20th century. So, there, so uh, by the time you get to 1930, uh, you can clearly see that there's quite a lot of popular discontent um, aimed at the, uh, the oligarchical republic which uh, was arguably one of the factors that contributed to its downfall. I mean, the one, one thing that possibly helped Vargas in his, his original coup in 1930 was you know, popular support. And, and then he had to pay back uh, the people for their support. And, and uh, so that, to, to some extent, might explain his, um, his series of, of popular, populist even, um, decisions um, such as the the, the systematization of, of workers' rights, well, the creation even of, of, of such a thing, and minimum wage, the institution of the minimum wage, which until then had been completely non-existent. You know, there was no such thing in Brazil. Um, so yes, um, I think in the end you can, you can see it as a gradual, a gradual process by which he tightened his grip on power, and then you have this, this turning point in 1937. Um, and, and, and the, the Cohen plan hoax. It was, it was a total hoax. And it's, uh, um, but it was, it was fab the fact that it was fabricated um, um, indicates that, that there was a lot of thought that went into it. Like it was, there was a lot of forethought. Uh, and we, we can only guess at, at just how um, long Vargas had been planning uh, the, you know, the, the the thing he did in 1937, the, the final sort of tightening, tightening of his grip on power. <laughs> a couple more. Yeah, <laughs> okay, Hello, um, I'm Tristan and I'm from the University of Sheffield. And uh, this could be related to Lee's question, the first question that we had. And something that I've noticed, there's been a lot of political revolt, like through Brazilian, I mean, obviously, through Brazilian's history. Um, but there's never been a revolution like in Mexico, or has there? I don't know. Anyway, I was just wondering if, say, the landowners from, you know, after who inherited the land from the Portuguese crown, mm. Do they still exist and do these people, I don't want to use the phrase elites, but have the elites always existed through Brazil, yeah. say, up till now? Well, the, the short answer would be yes, definitely. Really? Um, yes, I mean, um, I would have to go into really complex um, prosopographical arguments uh, to, 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 uh, to demonstrate that uh, these families managed to persevere, they managed to reproduce themselves, and, uh, also, uh, and also their grip on power. 
Um, but, but we do have like individual families that can be traced back to the colonial period and they're still around and who still own land and who still have a, a sort of monopoly over government. Um, so, so, so there is, I, I would say that there is quite a lot of continuity in that respect. Um, I, I wouldn't want to exaggerate the continuity because, because again, this is not my area of expertise, but, but the sense I get from reading some of the literature and also speaking to colleagues is that, um, generally speaking, yes, there is quite a lot of continuity. There is quite a lot of elite um, um, perseverance, and obviously that means also the, 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 the perseverance of a certain type of social structure. You know, so inherent social inequalities. I would say that most of the basic um, roots of social inequality in Brazil today can be definitely traced back directly to the colonial period. And how does that transform the Yeah. Well, I, I think um, that might translate as um, the formation of a new elite. Um, so, so there are more recent elites as well, uh, elites that have um, that have um, that have developed family elite families that have developed ever since the second half of the 19th century with the European immigration. So the European immigration also meant the arrival of, of elite European families, uh, and some of these were based in São Paulo, like the Matarazzo clan, for example. Um, they weren't around, obviously, in the colonial period, but, but they, they come around, they, they come over in the second half of the 19th century, and, uh, and they set themselves, up as, set themselves up as major industrialists in Sao Paulo. Um, so industrialization brought about a, a, a partial renovation of the elite, um, as did um, neoliberalism, but the basic I would say that the basic roots of inequality in Brazilian society um, weren't significantly altered by neoliberalism. It, it's something that still needs to be worked out. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so, but as to your second question, which was about um, the, the revolutions, yeah, uh, well, um, I don't know. I think it depends on how you look at it. Um, we, I don't think there has been anything as dramatic or as recent as, for example, the, the Chiapas revolt in Mexico. I don't think any, anything like that um, has happened in Brazil in the last 50 years or so. There's that, there's that, although it's not, I think it's less militarized. No, no, it's less militarized. There was, in the, in the early 20th century, and this is something I completely um, ignored in my talk, shame, shamefully, um, uh, there was a major popular uprising in the northeastern states of Brazil in the early 20th century. Um, I, and it was, um, yes, the, 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 uh, the Cangasso, does, does that ring a bell too? Yeah, yeah. Um, so this was, um, you could describe it as a peasant revolt that was to some extent militarized. Um, and there are other examples, other small scale examples that could be identified um, throughout the last 100, 150 years or so of Brazilian history, but but um, certainly nothing as, as broad or as organized as, as the Chiapas revolt or, or the Zapatistas revolt in, in, in early 20th century Mexico. I think, I think yes, I think in that sense, um, you, you, it would be fair to say, as, as you just did, that, that um, there hasn't been any kind of major militarized revolutionary movement in, in Brazil so far. It is interesting, and I wouldn't be able to tell you why that is. I mean, I think there are all sorts of causes. Um, um, uh, well, yeah, yeah, it, it, it does in a way. Then, uh, but um, but yes. So, well, yeah. Well, thanks for your question. <laughs> okay. So, one last one. Yes. Hi, I'm Antonio. I'm from Seville. Um, 
uh, the the huge amount of production of money in the Spanish colonies uh, induced a, a phenomenon called uh, the revolution of the prices in Europe in the 16th century. I'd like to know if the gold production in Minas Gerais in the uh, 18th century made something similar. Thank you. Thank you for your question. J just to clarify, so, so you want to know whether the, the, the gold rush in Minas had an impact on the price of gold in Europe? Yes. Ah, right. Well, that's something I, I wouldn't be able to, to uh, elaborate on with any, any significant degree of, of <laughs> uh, propriety because um, I don't really know much about the, the economic history of, of modern Europe. Um, but I would, I would venture a guess that, that yes, I mean, um, when you flood the market, you know, with, with uh, a given commodity, in this case gold, I mean, one, one um, expected result is, is the, the lowering of the value, the, d the decrease in value. So, uh, and this is something that happens also in, um, in antiquity and, and the Middle Ages. Um, when, when you have periodically like people or, or communities that, that flood markets, uh, well-developed markets with, with um, precious metals, uh, specifically gold, what happens invariably is that the metal loses its value. So, so it's, um, I mean, I would, I would I, that's about as far as I can go because like I said, I, I don't really know much about, I, I'm sure it's a lot more complicated than that. I'm sure there are all sorts of other economic factors involved. But, um, but in a more basic way, I would, that's what I would expect um, would happen when, when um, Brazilian gold starts arriving in Europe. Of course, much of this gold, as, as I mentioned, was used um, for purposes other than the minting of coins. So a lot of the Brazilian gold that was appropriated by Portugal was um, was turned into coinage. That that much is um, is is certain. But a lot of it also went into um, decorating churches, you know, architectural features. And I'm not really sure how you would go about assessing the economic consequences of that. You know, the, the non coinage use of gold. Um, it's an interesting question, though. Thank you. Professor, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your um, cl uh, class of today. It was wonderful. And now we have um, the honor of the presence of our Dean of International Affairs, Professor Aziz. He's going to say a couple of words to you. Well, first of all, good morning to all of you. I just came here for a couple of quick words. I'm very glad to have such a distinguished group uh, of students here for the second edition of our, Brazilian, of our summer school on Brazilian studies. Um, we have prepared uh, what we consider a very exciting program for you over the course of the next two weeks. I wish you all an excellent time. For those who are not from Brazil, I hope you have an excellent time here in Brazil. Uh, for those of you who are here, I'm sure they will be very glad to show you around, right? And uh, uh, I believe that some of you will cre create connections for, uh, for life here. Uh, and that's one of the goals we have with this uh, summer school. The, our university, Federal Univers the Universidade Federal de Minas Gerais, or Federal University of Minas Gerais, is proud to be regarded as one of the top 10 in Latin America. Uh, five former presidents of the uh, Republic uh, we're members of our community, either as professors or students. Uh, among the justices of our Supreme Court, uh, judges of the International Court of Justice, all the last three Brazilian judges studied here. And 
we are very proud of the excellence of our research and teaching. Uh, I will have uh, my card distributed to you tomorrow morning if there is anything I can do uh, to make your stay better, please let me know. Okay? Thank you very much and have an excellent week.